Let's give it um, Daniel. Do you want to speak first, or you're good? Okay. Let's give it another minute, Rabbi Kurtz. But thanks for the intro. This is everyone's still gathering for a minute. Okay. Rabbi, are you giving the class? I'm not giving the class, actually. Oh. I am waiting a moment or two till everyone gathers, and then I'll make the introduction. Got it. How was your new grandson? Great, great. <laughs> oh, well, he's fantastic. Thanks for asking. Okay. We even have Arthur Smith here. This is amazing. Okay, we'll just give it a minute. Rabbi Kurtz, you're in charge of the muting, correct? That is correct. I will okay. mute without mercy. Okay. Well, the president is here. That means we can start soon. <laughs> I lost track of the time. I didn't realize. Oh, my God, 801. 801. Well. All right, so we can start. Um, Rabbi Kurtz, thank you very much for uh, pulling together the Zoom this evening. Appreciate that. I also want to give a special shout out to Daniel Shilowitz, um, who was our adult education coordinator. Let's all hear it for Daniel. A little thumbs up for him. We really appreciate it. And I want to welcome everyone for a gathering tonight, um, which God willing promises to be a, a fascinating and timely topic. I want to welcome our guest lecturer, Dr. Michael Avi Helfand. Uh, do you like being called, by the way, Dr. Michael Helfand or Avi Helfand? What do you prefer? Among friends, I'm Avi, so let's go with Avi. Okay, well, we're all friends here. That's good. And, you know, this is actually, you know, one of our first for the new season um, presentations and lectures, and I think we've all grown to appreciate the benefits of Zoom. You didn't have to travel here. You're in Philadelphia now? Los Angeles. Even Close. better. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> oh. So we really um, appreciate you uh, joining us. And I think as we've learned, whether it's in person or virtual, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. So we appreciate you taking the time uh, tonight to be with us. Uh, Dr. Helfen is an expert on religious law and religious liberty. He's a frequent author and lecturer. And he, uh, his work considers how the state treats religious law, custom, and practice. And I think your topic for this evening, before I give you the rest of the intro, is certainly one that's on a lot of people's minds uh, with both current events and things we've been struggling with, which relates, of course, to um, the notion of religious liberty, in particular, protecting people's uh, safety and security and also ability to practice their faith. He currently serves as professor of law and vice dean for faculty and research at Pepperdine Caruso School of Law, as well as visiting professor and Oscar Rubenhausen Distinguished Fellow at Yale Law School. He serves as a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute and received his JD from Yale Law School and PhD in political science from Yale University, um, a school that is uh, not too far from us in Stanford. Um, his academic articles have appeared in many law journals, including Yale Law Journal and the NYU Law Review. And he also provides commentary on clashes between law and religion has written for publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Tablet Magazine, and The Forward. Just on a personal note, because I don't know this, but we are family here since we're calling you Dr. Avi Helfand. Tell us about your family for a moment. Married, kids, your constellation. Where'd you grow up? Um, so first of all, if we're really friends, you don't call me doctor. It's terrible. I can't help you if something actually uh, important goes wrong. Okay. And second of all, um, in terms of family, married four children. Um, they are oh 15, 12, 8, and 2. Um, so just fair warning if you hear screaming in the background. Safe bet is on the two-year-old. Okay, sounds good. Well, you should have a lot of nachas, and Hashem should bless you in all your endeavors. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Helfen. Um, Avi, who is going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, there will be Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, um, I'll be moderating the chat at the end. So please send them to me in the chat section. So thank you very much again for your time this evening. Um, it is my pleasure. And I just threw on a shared screen. So hopefully slides are up. 
Um, my slides are immediately to my right. So if you see me um, looking to the right as if I'm ignoring you, no, I'm just looking to a second screen over here. So please forgive me. Um, also, I'm grateful to a moderated chat. If you have questions along the way, I will do my best um, to also try to um, keep uh, half an eye on the chat um, as I kind of uh, present the material. Sometimes it's, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit of law tonight. Um, I think important law. Um, but law tonight, and so if you have questions in the middle, um, I'll do my best to answer them as they come um, via the chat. Um, when uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel Shulowitz originally reached out to me um, and asked me for a topic, so, you know, this has been on my mind, issues of uh, religious liberty and the pandemic and how it is we as a community, as a faith community around the United States, around the world, have navigated faith commitments, commitments alongside um, health considerations. Um, there had been some litigation before the Supreme Court, if I'm being perfectly candid, since this isn't being recorded right now, I don't think. Um, um, I have myself in the midst of some litigation here in California, um, trying to navigate these competing claims. And so I suggested it as a topic. I did not know at the time um, that it would become quite as timely um, with the uh, current events in New York and increasing tension between the Jewish community, in particular, certain parts of the New York Jewish community and government. Exactly how do we navigate questions of religious liberty around the pandemic? Two kind of uh, very core commitments of ours, certainly both as Jews and as, a, and as a country. So my goal this evening is gonna be to try to walk you through what this thing is, meaning what I'd like you to come away with at the end is an understanding of what the objection looks like to various kinds of school closures, house of worship closures, why it's at least legally problematic or challenging, um, when it's okay, when it's not okay, and what the values at stake are. That's my goal. So if you come away with that and you have informed views on those issues as you read the news going forward, um, I'll consider it. Um, oh, I see, disclaimer, this session is being recorded. So just don't tell anybody about that litigation stuff in New York. Okay, great. Um, and for the record, since I'm in California, you need, okay, fine. Okay, good. So I'm um, good. Well, very excited this is being recorded and um, looking forward to chatting through. If you come away with um, being a more informed reader of the news going forward, I'll consider it to have been a, uh, the evening to have been a success. Okay, so where do I wanna start the story? I want to start the story, first of all, making sure we're on the same page in terms of our core text. Our core text for the evening is going to be the beginning of the First Amendment. Hopefully, some of these words are familiar. Um, these are the two religion clauses of the First Amendment. The First Amendment, the, the, um, what we sometimes refer to as the first freedom, is, uh, are these two religion clauses. One, the Establishment Clause, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The first commitment um, in ca captured in these 16 words is some version of separation of church and state. What that means, we'll talk about next time. The second of the clauses is something called the Free Exercise Clause. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. For those of you who want, are, are kind of sticklers for the words, the 14th Amendment allows us to cross out the word Congress, write in the word government. And the First Amendment therefore prohibits government from prohibiting our free exercise of religion. Now, of course, those words don't tell us a ton in and of themselves. And what we needed ultimately over time, the Supreme Court has refined the way in which we understand those words, understand those words in a way that are central to our conversation about how we're supposed to balance questions of religious practice and public health when it comes to government regulation. So I'm gonna start our story in 1990. 1990, um, there's a, two fellows, Al Smith and Galen Black. Lovely fellows. I wish I could find a picture of Galen Black. I searched high and low, but this is Al Smith. And Al Smith was discovered in 1989, discovered by his employer to have ingested peyote. Uh, peyote being, uh, I didn't actually know this at the time, peyote being like um, uh, as a, a mushroom of sorts or a cactus um, that's a hallucinogen. It's a illegal form of narcotics. And uh, Al Smith's and Galen Black's employer found out that they had been taking um, ingesting peyote. The two of them happen to have had the worst job for this, their employer to have discovered this. Anybody in the chat want to tell me what you think the worst job in the world might be for your employer to find out you've been popping mushrooms? Anybody want to guess? I'm going to just get you to practice using the chat. It's fun. Oh, come on. Everyone play along with me. It's fun. Okay, I still have disclaimer this is being recorded. 
Okay, truck driver yeah. from Sam. What else we got? Somebody pop something in the chat. Anybody? Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, I guess, um, supervisor or somebody regulating. That's not bad. I think you guys can do better. Anybody? What do we think? Usually I get like astronaut or fighter pilot. It turns out it was much worse. Um, Al Smith and Galen Black um, were actually counselors in a drug rehab center. You can't be a counselor in a drug rehab center and also be popping the shrooms. Everybody with me on that? You can nod your head for those of you who are on camera if uh, that makes sense to you. That seems eminently fair. And so Al Smith and Galen Black are terminated by their employer. So what do you do when you're terminated by your employer? Al Smith and Galen Black go to collect unemployment benefits, right? They have no job searching for new jobs. In the meantime, they'd like unemployment benefits. Here's the kicker. When you go to get unemployment benefits, you can't have been terminated for cause. If you're laid off, you can get unemployment benefits, but not if you did something wrong. You can't, I did something wrong at work and therefore I was terminated. And in turn, I show up and try to collect money from state government. So Al Smith and Galen Black show up to the unemployment office in Oregon. And uh, they say like unemployment benefits and they, the person at the unemployment office says, why were you terminated? And Al and Galen say, now, it must have been a slightly uncomfortable conversation. They say, we've been popping some shrooms. And you can imagine, they immediately said, well, you were terminated for cause. We're, you, can't, you can't be a counselor in a drug rehab center. Start taking illegal narcotics and think you're going to come to us and get unemployment benefits. Fair enough. But Al Smith and Galen Black said, no, 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 you don't understand. The reason why we ingest peyote is because it's part of our Native American church's practice. Um, before prayers, we ingest hallucinogens. And in fact, this is actually quite common among Native American tribes. Some use uh, peyote, um, some use uh, waska tea is another version uh, that's come up before the Supreme Court. Various forms of hallucinogens before they begin prayer services. I often think, obviously this isn't true for your congregation, but I often think that if I engage in such a practice, the sermon might be much more interesting by the time we go. Okay, fine, good, good. So before prayer, they um, ingest uh, various forms of hallucinogens. They say it's part of our Native American church's ritual. And if that's true, you can't tell us that we're gonna lose out on a government benefit that is available to everybody else just because we're engaging, engaging in a religious ritual. They say you are prohibiting our free exercise of religion. Because ultimately, to practice our religion, it's certainly not free. We had to give up a government benefit available to everybody else. This case goes up to the Supreme Court. This is probably the most important religious liberty case decided maybe ever by the Supreme Court. It's actually on November 4th, the Supreme Court will be considering whether or not to overturn this case. I say odds are low. But as of 1990, since 1990 and on, the Supreme Court announces the following rule. They say, Alan Galen, you lose. And the reason why you lose is because here's what it means to prohibit the free exercise of religion. A law prohibit does not prohibit the free exercise of religion if it applies to everyone. The Supreme Court used words to explain what it meant by this. It's neutral. We're not going after your religion and it's generally applicable. It applies across the board. We're not coming after you and we're applying it to everybody. We're not, to use the language of the court, we're not targeting you. You're not the object of our regulation, it just happens to be. We prohibit certain forms of narcotics. You happen to be taking some drugs. We didn't do it because we're going after religion. We did it because that's our rule and it incidentally burdened you. The Supreme Court said, that's fine. Prohibiting the free exercise of religion means only that we're protected from our religion being targeted by government. Now, it happens to be true that if it turns out that a law is not facially neutral or not generally applicable, meaning it is targeting religion, the government can still win so long as the, is it, it's the only way to do something really important. So let's say the government is targeting religion. And somebody says, why'd you do that? The government can still win a case by saying, oh, I'll tell you, this is the only way, targeting your religion is the only way for us to do something supremely important. 
I want you to already start thinking about health considerations, protecting public health as being supremely important, at least one would think so. So I can't, I know, I can't target religion if I'm government unless it's the only way for me to do something supremely important. Now, I've given you these two terms, facially neutral and generally applicable, the language that the Supreme Court uses. It, they're terms of art, they're complicated, it's not obvious what they mean. And so much of what's been going on in the pandemic is based upon doctrine, legal doctrine, that has evolved since 1990, trying to figure out what these words mean. On the one hand, you can think you might know what something means to be either neutral or not neutral. Are you discriminating against me or not? And generally applicable, the idea is I'm not treating religious conduct differently. I'm telling you what my goal is, I want to do the following. And then it, I apply that both in situations where the underlying conduct is religious and not religious. I'm not just going after peyote when you pop it before your Native American church practice. I'm going after all of peyote. Let's think about an area where this may uh, try to give a little more flavor to how this might play out. So our goal after subsequent to 99, 1990 is to try to figure out what it is we mean when we say someone is trying to target religion. Somebody's coming after religion. That's what the Supreme Court said we can't do. So let me give you an example of a case. Um, you all remember when um, San Francisco tried to ban circumcision? Is that familiar to anybody? Give me a thumbs up if you're on camera, if that sounds familiar to you. Okay, San Francisco back in uh, 2010, 2011 tried to ban circumcision. And, and here's the text of what they were about to put on a ballot for a referendum here in Cal my fine state of California. It is unlawful to circumcise, excise, cut or mutilate the whole or any part of the foreskin, testicles or penis of another person who has not attained the age of 18 years. Violation, a fine not to exceed $1,000 and or imprisonment in the county jail for a period not to exceed one year. Okay, let's everyone get the chat function if they can, try to see if they can use the chat function for a second. How many people think this rule targets religion? Yes, targets. No, doesn't target religion. I see a bunch of, I see two yeses. I see a no. It's two to one so far. Let's think about why you might say it does target religion. Well, it looks like it's talking about a religious practice. And so maybe you might say to yourself, I'm looking at this, it's targeting a religion. But then I think about it for a second. Wait, 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 wait. We said that to target religion means it's neutral. It's not going after specifically a religious practice. Anybody wanna guess what percentage of circumcisions in the United States have something to do with religion? 100. What'd you say? 100. 100%? I get 60%, 1%. Yeah, Sam's about right. By the way, I, I haven't figured out who Sam is yet, but he's nailing it. Um, where's Sam over here? Yeah, 2% is pretty close. According to the World Health Organization, it's between 2 and 3%, meaning 97 to 98% of folks are getting circumcised in the United States for reasons that have nothing to do with religion. And this rule is going after all circumcision. So if I asked you, is it targeting religion? at least by the numbers, it's a tough sell. Is it being applied across the board? Or are you treating religious and non-religious conduct differently? And again, when you stare at the words on the screen, the answer seems to be we're treating all of the same conduct similarly. You can see how it might be hard to make an argument when we look just at the text of this proposed. Um, initiative for referendum in California, it's, I'm sorry, not in California, in San Francisco, you can see how it would be hard to convince someone that it is not neutral, that it is not generally applicable, that it's targeting religion. It seems to be targeting circumcision. Now, the, this is why the initial arguments when this came up, people kind of looked at this and they said to themselves, we think this is constitutionally okay. At least it's hard to make an argument why it's the problem if all we care about is the targeting of religion. 
That was at least the first go at it. And then people started doing a little digging. And it turns out that the organization behind this circumcision ban was an organization called MGMBill.org. MGM, this context, does not stand for Metro Golden Mayor, but it stands for Male Genital Mutilation. And they had a president, Matthew Hess. Um, Matthew Hess was not only the president of this organization, Matthew Hess had a side job. And the side job was, it may still be, he was a cartoonist. President of MGMBill.org, Matthew Hess, his cartoon was called Foreskin Man. Anybody here subscribe to Foreskin Man? Anybody? You can give me a thumbs up if you do. I'm seeing no thumbs up. It would be odd. I've never, get, I've never talked about this and somebody said yes. Okay, let's talk about Foreskin Man for a second. Um, it has a hero, surprising turn of events. The hero of this cartoon is Foreskin Man. Frustrated by society's failure to protect its most vulnerable citizens, Foreskin Man has taken up the fight against male genital mutilation, aided by the power of his technologically advanced plasma boots. I have no idea what that means. I feel like it's an inside joke that I just don't get. Foreskin Man flies above the city to hunt down criminals who cut the genitals of innocent boys. It is the dawn of a new era. Circumcisers beware. Okay, great. Anybody want to see the villain? No, maybe. No interest. I see one head. Daniel's nice. He nods heads. I see uh, Joseph Kaplan's here. He knows what's coming. Okay, here is the villain. Yes, that's right, Mark. It's Monster Mohel. This is all bad, guys. This is all bad. Nothing excites Monster Mohel more than cutting into the penile flesh of an eight-day-old infant boy after the glorified Brittany law is complete. The delicious Matisse of the pad provides the icing on the cake. <coughs> Intactivists have been pressuring Monster Mohel to retire, but that will never happen. They'll have to pry the scissors from his cold, dead hand. There's more good stuff. This is kind of one of the initial scenes of this issue of Foreskin Man. I assume this looks like all the Brit Milas you've been to, right? You know, the Mohel comes in, he's flanked by the guys with Uzis. Then they have the traditional binding of the mother. Um, while the Moho's eyeballs appear to disappear. And then finally, they approach the baby that has the face of a 40-year-old. Okay, everyone got the basic idea. These are disturbing images. Maybe I shouldn't make light of them. I will say that I have a friend who tweeted and was picked up by Time Magazine. His response was, um, San Francisco, 1930s Germany called, they want their cartoons back. And that sounds about right and it's all disturbing if it weren't so potentially legally useful. When I saw this for the first time, I was elated. Couldn't have been happier. Has anybody figured out why I was so happy? Yeah, David's shaking his head, David knows. Of course, because as soon as you see this, you say to yourself, oh, the text didn't help me show that this uh, pro uh, proposed circumcision ban discriminated, but these cartoons are deeply anti-Semitic. And if that's true, maybe we can make an argument that the purported regulation targets religion. Everybody with me on the argument? Now let's think about this, the secondary problem to all this. Okay, it's all well and good. I'm looking at this and I say, oh, this is all, it's, it's all uh, anti-Semitic now. But do I really know that? Let's think about two kinds of problems, okay? One kind of problem is, whose intent? Matthew Hess woke up in the morning, created an organization. The organization advocated to get somebody to draft a petition. The petition was signed by thousands of San Franciscans. Then it would be made into a referendum, uh, put on the ballot as a referendum where you'd have all of San Francisco voting. Exactly, Mark says. Why, but why does the cartoon necessarily define the bill? Precisely kind of the buildup as I just described it. Just because you have one guy who appears to have some anti-Semitic tendencies, or let's actually flatten that, is an anti-Semite, does that necessarily mean that it infects the entire bill given all the other steps in its creation? One problem whenever you're talking about discriminatory intent, I wanna prove something is targeting religion. I wanna do it based on the intent of someone. Whose intent? 
the guy drafted it, the guy voted for it. How does it work? You can see the problem there. Step one of the problem. Step two of the problem is even more challenging. You know, sometimes, typically something's enacted by a legislature. Even if I can figure out what somebody's intent is, should I ever be using intent given the uncertainty of trying to figure out whose intent controls? Congress passes a law tomorrow. Whose intent do I look for? The Senate passes a law. How many senators do I need? Six, 12, 18? Intent is very slippery, especially when you're dealing with laws that are made by multiple people. And one of the reasons this example is so useful is because I think it helps highlight even when you think you have direct evidence that someone who played a prominent role in the creation of a law is motivated by anti-Semitism, there are a number of good reasons to say still maybe that's not enough. And that's dangerous because if what we need for the First Amendment to be triggered is the targeting of religion, the challenges we have in identifying discriminatory intent make it very hard to trigger the First Amendment. Okay, I wanna leave that for a second. These problems are far from new. This is an ongoing debate with respect to law generally. You know, can we crack open somebody's skull and try to figure out what's going on? And even if we can, should we let that count? The most prominent case where this came up was a case in 1993. And it became like an all out drag out fest between Supreme Court justices. They could not get a majority of the Supreme Court to respond to the issue we just raised. The case was actually took place in the city of Hialeah, a city in Florida. Um, and they actually had a group of Santerians who had moved into town. Santerians, it's a Haitian religion, and moved into town, built a church called the Church of Lukumi Babluai. And one of the things they were doing in this church was they were sacrificing animals, they had an animal sacrifice ritual. And when people started finding out about this, the city went nuts. They had a town meeting. People said, we got to get the Santerians. We got to get them out of town. We don't want those gross people in town. They're terrible. It's disgusting. We need them out. And so they enacted a number of laws prohibiting animal sacrifice. And the Santerians, not surprisingly, turned around and said, you're discriminating against us because of our religion. Oh, I see a question from Joseph. With what you call the first freedom, can't we argue that any taint of anti-religious discrimination is sufficient to declare the law unconstitutional? Maybe, we could. I don't know what any would mean, but no matter where we draw the line, we're gonna have line drawing problems. But let's leave that in the background, it's a fair question. As we think about um, our, our case over here, the Church of Lukumi Babaluai be the city of Hialeah. Church, the church says, goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, we're being targeted against because of our religion. The question was, how do we operationalize this idea of targeting religion? What does it look like? The Supreme Court said a bunch of interesting things in trying to give meaning to what, it, what, what targeting religion actually looks like. They started by saying, you start by taking a look at the text. And the text of the law said we're prohibiting animal sacrifice. And the court said, you know what that is? That's language that sounds religious. And that makes us think the law, based on its text itself, not what's going on in people's brains, text itself looks like it's going after religion. You know what else was the problem the Supreme Court said? They seem to be saying that we'll let you engage in the killing of animals for non-religious reasons, but not for religious reasons. Here, this is from the court's decision. Necess uh, test of necessity devalues religious reasons for killing by judging them to be of lesser import than non-religious reasons. One of the things the regulation said is you can only engage in the necessary killing of animals. Well, who told you what's a necessary killing of an animal? You say a necessary killing of an animal is for food. I say a necessary killing of an animal is for my religion. Why does the court get to somewhat, why does the city of Hialeah get to arbitrarily decide that non-religious reasons for killing animals are super important, 
but religious reasons less important. Supreme Court said a couple of other really interesting things. They noted that there were lots of exceptions to the rule. You could engage in hunting, extermination of mice and rats, euthanasia, stray animals, infliction of pain for medical experiments on animals, all those things you could do. If you said to us, city of Hialeah, that animal cruelty is so important to you that you're banning animal sacrifice, why do you let all those other things go on? That seems weird. The Supreme Court, based on the text and scope of the law, ultimately concluded you're targeting religion. We see the language you're using, we see what you apply it to, and we've concluded by looking at what you've done that you are going after religion. I see David says, did the animal sacrifices violate any existing laws regarding animal cruelty, for example? Not clear. The record was ambiguous. They kind of went to the attorney general and asked questions. The answer is probably not, but not clear. It's a, it's, it's a fair question. But certainly these laws in their scope and text went after religion. Now, one of the crazy things is that the Supreme Court had to go to such lengths. Good, we've learned something from the Supreme Court. We can look at your text and we can see maybe, you know, the, the circumcision ban doesn't quite do it. But if you use religious language, maybe I can learn something about what, you're, what the law is doing. And the scope, if you have, if you let religious reasons get regulated, but non-religious reasons kind of slip by, or you give exceptions for this kind of conduct, but not for religious conduct. You've gerrymandered the law to be of a certain shape where it only seems to be covering religious stuff or disproportionately covering religious stuff. Then we have a problem. Now the Supreme Court noted, as we said at the outset, the government, the city of Hialeah could justify this if it was the only way to do something really important. But the Supreme Court said, if you think it's so important, city of Hialeah, to regulate this type of behavior, why do you let all these exceptions? If I've got something really important going on, if I think I've got an objective, it's got to happen. I don't give out, get out of jail free cards. It's too important. And so the Supreme Court said, listen, we see what you've done, your text, your scope, you've built a law that's going after religion. And you made so many exceptions that we don't believe you think there's something super important going on. And so you have to let the Church of Lukumi Babuai practice animal sacrifice. Here's the thing the Supreme Court didn't do all the way back in 1993. There was a town meeting where people said the damnedest things. I mean, people said on record, just Looney Tune stuff. We got to get them. They're terrible. We're going after them. And there weren't five justices back in 1993 who thought the fact that people said that's what they wanted to do, that that counted to tell us the law was discriminatory. This was a fight between, at the time, Justice Kennedy and Justice Scalia. Justice Kennedy said, look, it's all relevant, all the stuff that people said when making the law. I don't need scope and yeah, the text. That's all fine. They said, we're coming after religion. Call it. Call it a day. And Justice Scalia said, we can't figure out a singular motive when you've got a collective legislative body. Yeah, you've got six people on record, eight people, nine. It was a whole city. I can't crack some, open somebody's head and try to figure out what's going on. There are too many heads. Justice Scalia said, yeah, text, scope, use the words of the law, but not what's going on in people's heads. Now, this is hard. You know, if you want to get a sense of why it's hard, consider the following. Do you remember like a couple years back in New Jersey, there are multiple uh, rounds of air of controversies. Uh, multiple towns were trying to ban over the past couple of years, Arabs in Mawa, surrounding towns. Um, they didn't want them. And the response, at least initially, was an attempt to try to convince them and this and that. But ultimately, there were charges of anti-Semitism leveled against these towns for their refusal to allow the Jewish communities there to build an Erev. And one of the reasons was a petition went around um, in one of the towns where people from the town said what, that they, you know, whether or not the, the petition was for people who didn't want an Erev in town. 
And they said a whole bunch of stuff. It was, it was like available online for the public. So you have this city of Mala, people of the city of Mala signed a petition. This is what we, why we don't want to have an Arif. This is why we need a law prohibiting the Arif. And they said things like the following. This group of people is known for entering community and taking it over for their own advantage. They are known for taking a lovely community, and turning it into a rundown, dirty, unwanted place to live. Our town is such a great place. And if these things move in, they will ruin it. They are clearly trying to annex land like they've been doing in Occupy Palestine. I don't want these rude, nasty, dirty people who think they can do whatever they want in our nice town. I don't want my town to be gross and infested with these nasty people. We need to protect our quality of life. There is absolutely no benefit in allowing the Orthodox Jewish contingent into Mala. Now, if I said to you, this is what people are saying in the town, why they're gonna prohibit the air, if you'd say to me, they're anti-Semites. I hope that isn't too far a bridge for you. But when litigation ended up in court, you can imagine what their lawyer said. Lawyer said, discriminatory intent, what people are thinking based on what they've said, doesn't matter, not relevant. They said in 1993, there weren't five justices that told you, you can take into account what people are saying to prove a law goes after religion. And you can see how this is a problem. The Arif team that takes on all these cases, I got a call the morning this brief was filed. They said to me, really? I said, really? Tough call, different courts go different ways. A court could look past someone engaging in anti-Semitic statements who's a member of a legislature because what they say isn't how we determine if a law targets religion, it's based on text and scope. So what do we do? This was all true till a couple of years ago. And you may remember just a couple of years back in 2018, we had this big blowout Supreme Court case. Baker doesn't want to bake a cake for a same sex couple. Everybody thought, oh man, this is the big ticket case. We're gonna have a battle between religious rights and LGBT rights. How do we balance the two in our constitutional order? And the Supreme Court gave us something that nobody expected. I shouldn't say nobody. Some very smart lawyers figured out arguments along these lines and pushed them. Good, Susan says, isn't the key issue that, uh, that it was for a wedding? Sort of, but not really by the time the Supreme Court was done with it. By the time the Supreme Court finished giving its explanation as to what should happen, it looked like a completely different case than anybody expected. And here, in 2018, the Supreme Court gets this case. Jack Phillips doesn't want to bake a cake for a same-sex couple. He says it's for their, actually for, not for their wedding, it was for their, um, the celebration of their wedding because ironically enough, at that time, Colorado itself discriminated against same-sex weddings. But Jack Phillips, a business open to the public, refused to bake a cake for a same-sex couple to celebrate their wedding and Businesses open to the public in Colorado at the time weren't allowed to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. And as a result, the question was, did Jack Phillips, did his religious motivation for not wanting to bake that cake get him out of the rule that prohibited him from discriminating against customers on the basis of sexual orientation? The Supreme Court said, forget all the big ticket stuff. When the Supreme Court looked at the record of how Jack Phillips was treated in the adjudication of his case, they ultimately decided the following. We don't know how that big ticket question works. We haven't decided it yet. We may decide it on November 4th this year. But in 2018, they said, we think Jack Phillips wasn't treated fairly. Why? Well, first of all, they noted a couple of things. One of the commissioners, when listening to Jack Phillips' arguments, responded that it was terrible when religion was used to hurt people. It was like the Holocaust. You have the text up on the screen of his extended comments. And the Supreme Court thought that the idea, whatever you think of the merits of the case, of comparing Jack Phillips' conduct to things like slavery and the Holocaust, indicated that the commissioners were not treating Jack Phillips, the baker, neutrally. 
There's another weird, weird wrinkle to the case. There's a guy after Jack Phillips got in trouble who decided I'm gonna cause some trouble myself. He went to a bunch of bakeries and said, I'd like you to bake me a cake. They said, sure, what kind of cake? He said, I'll tell you. It should look like a Bible. And on one side, it should have a, a relevant verses from Leviticus about sexual, um, homosexuality being an abomination. And on the other side of the cake, um, it should have like a, a no sign through a same sex couple. He said, bake me that cake. They said, no. He said, you're discriminating against me because of my religion. And he went to the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. He said, if you're gonna find Jack Phillips, you need to find these bakeries. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission said, no, 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 no. They just found your cake offensive. And Jack Phillips said, I found the same sex wedding cake offensive. Oh, how do we tease this one out? The Supreme Court said, we're not gonna bother. What we've determined is Colorado didn't treat Jack Phillips the same way it treated others. And therefore it wasn't neutral in resolving Jack Phillips claims. Why am I making a big deal of this? How did they know that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission wasn't neutral? from the text of their decision, from the scope of their decision, or from things the commissioners said. For the first time, post-1993, the Supreme Court agreed that we can crack people's skulls open to decide if they're discriminated. When this case came out that very morning, I was actually sitting somewhere out getting ready to see if I'd be called for jury duty. Case came out, I read it, and I forwarded it immediately to the ARIV team, and I said, you got what you wanted. Now it's no longer legally irrelevant. Justice Kennedy won the day. In 1993 now, we would view that case as whatever they said tells us they're discriminating. And now in 2018, we get to look at the facts of a case and say, you said things to me that prove you're discriminatory. It's not only about the text of a law. That's a big deal, hopefully you can see. If we live in an environment where the only way we can prove a law discriminates against our, uh, the only way we can prove a law is unconstitutional is if it discriminates against our religion, now we get to use people's discriminatory words against them. Okay. Let me give you one more case and then I'm gonna to turn to Cuomo. You know, it's not just the issue of neutral. How can I tell if somebody's discriminating against me? How do I know if they're coming after me if they're not neutral? But there's another puzzle that comes up. So I've showed you the neutral puzzle. Can we use words against people? Answer now, yes. On the flip side, the other question is, what does it mean to apply something across the board? And maybe the best case that regularly gets cited in these cases is the relatively recent New York litigation over Mitzitsa Bipak. You may remember this from a couple years back. New York decided to regulate, oh, let me see what I have. I hear the point, David. It's not what the Supreme Court thought. They thought it was religiously discriminatory, but you could read the record a different way. Okay, let me talk about this Mitzitsa Bipak case for a second. So, um, for those who don't know, Mitzitsa the Paz, translated by the city of New York, is direct oral suction. And the thought is the following. Back in the third and fourth century, um, Gemara was particularly committed to the thought that whatever we did for, with respect to circumcision, would be with respect to bris milah, would be the cleanest and healthiest way to do it. They wanted to find a way to make sure to cleanse the wound in a way that was the most sanitary. And back in the third and fourth century, Chazal thought that the cleanest way to do it was through Mitzitsa bepeh. You would do direct oral suction, removing some of the blood and thereby making sure the baby was as healthy as possible. Turns out that we have quite a lot of bacteria in our mouth and so mitzitsa bepeh ends up being quite a challenge for a child. It actually is very dangerous. And if somebody has the herpes simplex virus in their mouth and transmits it through mitzitsa bepeh to the baby, it can lead to brain damage or death. When New York City um, kind of happened upon this, their view was we need some way to deal with this problem that Mitzitsa Bepe is going on. And so New York City issued regulations. The regulations is precisely the text that you see on your screen right now. This is every word of it. Ultimately, what New York City says was, 
if you're a Mohel and you want to engage in the seats of the pay, you need to provide informed consent. Tell the parents what you're about to do, right? Put down a piece of paper, have them sign, and if they're okay, once they've given informed consent, you can engage in the seats of the pay. Okay, fair enough. Various Jewish groups filed suit, and they said the following. You have a special regulation for direct oral suction. Look at the text on the top. A special rule for direct oral suction. And they said, the only group that's engaging in this is Jews. You're targeting our religious practice. Oh, it may be true that we're allowed to do it if we get informed consent, but you're still targeting us. You have a special rule for our religion. You're not applying it across the board. And interestingly, and ultimately, a federal court of appeals agreed. And the court said, if you're telling me that your goal is to protect against the herpes simplex virus, why are you only going after this conduct? Most herpes simplex virus transmissions have to do with things happening in hospitals. But you seem to have a special rule for direct oral suction. That's targeting of religion. Now, the court said maybe this is the only way to protect against something really important, and it sent it to a lower court to figure out. Now, why is that important? Let's think about that for a second. Here, the Supreme Court said, we don't think they're, dis I'm sorry, the Federal Court of Appeals said, we're not, we don't think you're discriminating against religion. It's not like you're anti-Semitic, but we're concerned in a case where laws are being applied in one, we, you have a rule that applies to religious practice in one way, even though it doesn't apply to non-religious practice in the same way. If your goal is to get rid of the herpes simplex virus and you go after only religious transmission and not non-religious transmission, that starts to look like targeting of religion. Just like when you say you can yeah, kill animals for the, you can't kill animals for the purpose of animal sacrifice, but you can for medical science. When you start carving up where you apply a rule to, when you start carving up whether or not you want to apply a rule to religious conduct but not non-religious conduct, when you have rules that don't have clear guidelines as to when they apply to what sort of conduct, here the federal court said we also have a problem. When you kind of take a step back from all of what I've said up until now, you can hopefully see that to identify that a law is discriminatory under the First Amendment that targets religion, you've got the cracking the skull open and looking what's inside option, and you have the scope of the rule, is it being applied in the same way given the objective of the law to both religion and non-religion? This is important, and hopefully this gives you a sense of the way in which people are going about litigation with respect to the pandemic. You know, one of the issues in the pandemic came early on. A church that said, our capacity is being restricted way more than other businesses are, and that's not fair to us. And the Supreme Court said, interesting, interestingly, it held against the church. Chief Justice Roberts said, you're being treated exactly like other institutions that are like you. You're a church, you're open to the public, people come in and they stay for a while. You're like lectures and concerts and movie show and spectator sports. And all things that are similar are being treated in the same way. Nobody is targeting you. Interestingly, some of the some, four Supreme Court justices objected. They said, that's not what's going on. You're being treated differently than institutions that are like you, like supermarkets, restaurants, retail stores. Ultimately, the idea of targeting whether or not we've chopped things up so that religion's treated one way, non-religion's treated another way, the Supreme Court says we need to treat things that are alike in the same way. And the Supreme Court thought, when you look at a house of worship, it looks quite like a lecture or a movie theater, and we're treating everything that is just as risky the same way across the board. That worked for a while. 
that argument that houses of worship were being treated in the same way. They weren't being chopped up in the same way, like we have a rule, one thing for direct oral suction, but something else for other forms of HSV virus. One thing for animal sacrifice, but something else for when we need animals for medical science. And that worked quite a lot in New York until the George Floyd protests. During the George Floyd, pro Floyd protests, uh, a reporter from Hamodia actually asked Mayor de Blasio, said to Mayor de Blasio, why are you allowing the protests and not allowing similar numbers in houses of worship? Mayor de Blasio at this moment had two choices. He could have gone the Supreme Court route. He could have said, I'll tell you why, because houses of worship are indoors, the protests are outdoors. Houses of worship are uh, conduct themselves under, on an ongoing basis. These protests are for a shorter period of time. So they're not the same, and therefore these can work. More risky conduct will all be treated the same way. That's not what he said though. Instead of giving a uh, explanation of the disparate conduct based on risk to show in which the way in which everything was being treated, everything similar was being treated similarly, he said, the George Floyd protests are more important than what goes on in houses of worship. Same risk, but the George Floyd protests are ultimately more important. I put the quote up for you. Yara Rosenberg in a recent article referred to this as the original sin of the pandemic. I actually think that's an excellent phrase. He had a choice in front of him to justify these rules based on risk, and he chose instead to do it based on importance. And once he did that, once he said, these two activities need to be regulated for the same reason, we just give an exception to one and not the other based on how important they are, he just looked like the city of Hialeah all over again, saying that animal sacrifice is no good, but killing animals for medical experiments is okay. He looked like City of New York saying, Mitzitz of the pet, that we need to regulate because the HSV virus, but we don't have regulations for other forms of the HSV virus. And not surprisingly, the fact that he said this ended up, ended being, ended up being, used, uh, being used in federal court a couple of months back in order to strike down some of New York's regulations. Now, on the heels of all this, we have what's in the news right now. Governor Cuomo's more recent attempts to regulate various communities' hotspots, red zones, orange zones, and yellow zones. And not surprisingly, as far as I know, there are at least four federal lawsuits going on right now um, arguing that these rules are unconstitutional. Hopefully by now, you have all the tools you need to figure out what you think about this case. Option A, you can say to yourself, what has he said, right? We're post Masterpiece Cake Shop, post the Baker case. The Supreme Court has said, you can use somebody's words against them. So here's an example of something he said. Of course, the problem is these are just a couple of words largely taken out of context. These are the words that appear in a lot of the federal complaints, but you know, what to make of all of his words altogether? Identifying somebody's intent is super complicated and hard. And the odds of successfully doing so are particularly challenging, maybe even more challenging in the midst of a global pandemic where maybe we give government by and large the benefit of the doubt that they're trying to save people from something incredibly dangerous. So a number of uh, plaintiffs have tried to use words against Governor Cuomo and those have proven extremely challenging. There's a flip side to this story though. and this flip side of the story has become increasingly, I'd say, prominent with respect to litigation around these questions. You know, originally when Governor Cuomo announced that, that this is what they, they were going to do, they're going to have red zones, yellow zones, and orange zones, it seemed that they were going to do it based upon zip codes. Find a zip code, lots of cases, you're a red zone. But later in the week, Governor Cuomo announced they wouldn't be using zip codes. In fact, Based on, uh, this just came up on Friday, the uh, commissioner of the New York State Health Department said, we don't, he said, you may be a red zone if you have 3% positivity. It may be the case that you have it in a geographic area. And for orange zones and yellow zones, we don't actually have any clear rules. Now, 
Once you, as the government, concede that for red zones, orange zones, and yellow zones, the imposition of regulations are not based upon a particular number applied across, across the board, you can see how, based on what we've discussed up until now, you may start getting yourself in trouble. Why? Because again, it has to be applied across the board. Otherwise, you're like the city of Hialeah. And if it's not applied across the board, we might say, hey, that counts as targeting religion. Now, you may remember, the government is allowed to target religion if it's trying to accomplish something extremely important. How courts end up balancing these two considerations is likely how the upcoming wave of litigation goes. Either the state will increasingly refine its rules to apply equally across the board with defined metrics. Otherwise, people may say, we see that these rules are being applied to areas that have large Jewish populations. How is it that this population you decided yes and this population you decided no without a clear numerical threshold for deciding what zone is what? Or a court may say, we get that you have different metrics and you're kind of using the smell test over here and we're gonna be okay with that because of the stakes of public health. But all told, much of this litigation will, as hopefully you can see from this affidavit, be about government providing clear rules to regulate religious communities. I raise this for a couple of reasons. You know, there's the legal issue that I've been trying to convince you of today, to hope that in the midst of all the, cra in the midst of the crazy news cycle with people literally screaming on all sides, to provide you with hopefully a clear explanation or a relatively clear explanation as to what the issue is. The lack of clear rules means that it's hard to see that this is generally applicable. What's your number? On the flip side, it's not just about the law. You know, so much of what we've experienced over the past couple of months, it's not just law, but it's about trust in government. Our ability to say, to say, you know, listen, we believe that the government is working with us in order to try and protect all of us from extraordinary circumstances. And the reason why we follow government in many ways is because we trust it. If there's no trust for government, if I think government is here to punish as opposed to protect, the odds of my following the government's rules dip exponentially. General applicability as a concept is a way in which to make sure that the government is applying rules across the board, even if we don't think they're necessarily discriminate, discriminating, they're coming after us intentionally. It's a way in which to say sometimes when you don't have precise rules and you use the smell test, you think of religion as a little bit less than. And in order to protect against that impulse, we say provide clear rules across the board. It's not just a legal requirement, but it's a trust building requirement. I'd submit to you that if we're gonna find our way out of the current conundrum going on in New York, government is going to have to provide clearer rules, both to satisfy the law and to help rebuild trust. Because without those two things, oh, you can find people all day and all night and they'll come back because they don't trust you. And trust, trust comes from clear, transparent rules that apply to everyone. Okay, that's what I've got for me. I know I went a little bit over time. I'm, I'm game to stay for questions for as long as people, well, not as long as people want, but um, if anybody has questions, please feel free to fire away. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was uh, excellent. Um, I would suggest if people have questions at this point, you can put them in the chat. It might be easier, or you just talk, but let's, uh, um, but thank you very much. Dr. Halpern, can you do the screen share on your end?
Oh, sure. Thank you. Avi, could I ask a question about the Mitzitsa Bepeh? Sure. If, if there had been a broad law about healthcare providers dealing with young children wearing gloves and wearing masks and had taking a, a herpes test before they touched babies, et cetera, and had one clause that was the regulation that you showed us, would that have changed the picture? I don't know. It's hard to say. The point that the court was looking for is hopefully the underlying part, point that I was able to express, which is, you know, so much of HSV viruses are transmitted in hospitals. And so, you know, what they really wanted, they wanted the government to show or prove that they were attacking all instances of the HSV virus with the same gusto. You've had, you know, they had like three weeks of testimony about it with respect to Mitzitsa Bepad, but nobody seemed as interested with other forms of the HSV virus. So whatever the additional rules were, they would have had to convince a court that there was equal gusto, so to speak, on all, all forms of HSV virus. I, I guess my, my, my more specific point is that even the, if, had they done that, had it been taken two years and they had that, but since Mitzitsa Bepad only applies to Jews, would that still have been an argument that they could make? Or in that case, well, that's the fact, that it happens only Jews do that, so, but it's not targeted. It's a fair question. You know, I, I, the, the court, if when you read the opinion, it's hard to know how much it needed to collect the stuff that bothered it for it to say that it was a problem. Keep in mind, the court ultimately said, like, if this is super duper important, this is the only way to do it, we're going to be okay with this kind of regulation. And sometimes, you know, the seats of the pet case is an important example because it's a reminder that sometimes. Sometimes government that is dealing with a problem that is specific to a, a, a single faith community. And it can't be the case that their a faith community is acting in a way that's inappropriate, that's deeply problematic. And the government has to say, we can't go after religion. What we need when the government goes after a particular faith community is that it's the only way to do something super duper important, that there are no other alternatives. And if that's the case, then it's fine. And whether that's Mitzi's of power, global pandemic, the government has a right to do that. And, you know, when it comes to religious liberty advocacy, maybe the response at that moment is not to try to push the envelope. As I said, I still worry about the trust piece of all of it. Um, yes, uh, uh, Sam Soroka. Um, thank you very much. This is very, very informative. Um, before the pandemic, New York dealt with the, um, the, the, the measles outbreak in, in Rockland County. Yep. I, I have a hard time kind of like recalling what exactly, what measures were passed and how they dealt with that. Um, but if they did kind of issue a kind of quarantine on the community, I don't know if they did, would that be kind of a, a precedent? You know, you know, like tonight was supposed to be this wedding in Brooklyn of the grandson of the Satmar Rebbe. Like the writing was on the wall that something you know, it was a super, it could be a super spreader event, right. you know, for Cuomo to come out and say, you guys aren't having that wedding. Um, you know, is that, does that kind of touch on the, you know, importance of, uh, you know, of a health, of a health risk that's clearly there, um, you know, to, uh, to stop it. So if I recall correctly on the measles outbreak, um, what, uh, government was using was CDC had guidelines for what constituted an outbreak, and those were actually pretty well defined metrics um, across the board. And once you had an outbreak, there are certain I don't remember exactly what got triggered, um, but something got triggered. You know that's and that's one of the benefits of having like something like the CDC provide you know very clear guidelines. And so nobody says why are you doing this to me? The answer is you flip the switch. There's nothing I can say at that point. Um, there are also some other things going on in the measles outbreak with respect to whether or not we give religious exemptions um, from people getting vaccinated. New York struck down the religious exemption. You used to have, you could get religiously exempted from, uh, from getting vaccinated, which um, I think that measles outbreak uh, finally convinced New York that that was a bad idea. Um, but ultimately, you had, I think, relatively clear rubrics for determining what an outbreak was, which is, you know, Part of that is I would just want to be fair to government as fair as humanly possible. Um, 
you know, measles outbreaks we've been dealing with for a while. And we have a well-developed way of thinking about them and figuring out what the pro what, you know, what needs to be targeted. I mean, governments right now are dealing with things they've never seen before and don't know what to do and are worried that if they spend time getting it just right, you know, the ship has sailed and, and it, it spread to an entire borough. And, you know, given what New York's been through, you know, hard to blame government. The question is kind of, do our expectations of government evolve with each passing month as we learn more and more? Like at what point do we say to government, you need to do a little bit better than that in terms of regulating and defining ultimately what constitutes an outbreak? I, I hope that was sufficiently responsive. I hope the CDC comment, I think, was directly responsive. I think the rest was secondary commentary. Yeah, yeah. And I guess a, sec a corollary to that is, you know, what if these groups make it harder than the government? You know, what if, the, you know, what if, what if there are anti-vaxxers who, you know, kind of, you know, decide, you know, to, to continue that, uh, you know, strain of measles? And, you know, if there are people who deny that, you know, the, the, you know, the pandemic and it's, you know, it's deadliness and, you know, make it hard for the government. And, you know, as, as someone said, like, you know, the Jews aren't feeling targeted, they're kind of targeting themselves, you know, in these kind of events. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Listen, when I, when I personally think about what's going on right now and why it's so frustrating to me, when I first saw all of this, I said to myself, well, let me just be perfectly candid. I said, people are misbehaving. They're doing bad stuff and the government's got to come down on people doing bad stuff. That was my view. I hadn't looked into what the regulations look like particularly carefully. And then as I started poking around, because I was trying to figure out exactly how the rule worked, I found myself unable to figure out what a red zone was. And this struck me as nuts. Like, how could there not be a rule for this thing? I'm in California. We have very clear rules. My county is a purple zone. I can tell you exactly how. It's a math formula. I can tell you what the math formula is. I've got an Excel spreadsheet that tracks it every day. So I can tell you if I'm a red zone, I can tell you if we have more zones than you guys. We've got purple, red, orange, and yellow. So we're, we're better. Um, I can tell you, and it was maddening that I can't find, you know, here we have this new form of regulation. I can't tell you what makes something a red zone. And that gave me a little bit of pause. Now, what you have building ultimately right now in New York are two narratives that everyone is acting just right enough and just wrong enough to make this the most toxic of environments possible. The state on the one hand is protecting people from death, from straight up death. They're just doing it quickly and in a way where they're, they're not being clear on what the guidelines are. And on the flip side, you have a community that on one hand, I think that abiding by social distancing and masks and all that, those are requirements that save lives. Those are things that people have to do. At the same time, they're being subjected to a set of rules that aren't clear that seem to disproportionately target them in a way that I would even say raises some serious constitutional problems. So perfect. We've got government who's trying to save lives and a religious community that feels like they're not being treated like equal citizens. How do we want to sort this one through? And that's why I feel ultimately the response to all these things has to be the, the way out is... is, is um, government improving its rules and rebuilding trust because otherwise I, I, this strikes me as devolving into something extremely dangerous um, especially with what i suspect we've got coming on the horizon with, you know with respect to the pandemic so i have hopes but i also have i'd say deep worries i see there's a question from um, s kraus about um in the Sue's case that was the case a um, couple months back where actually somebody won a religious liberty claim against um, the state of New York. Um, and so th there's this case, you know, we're not dealing with this for the first time. There's a case from uh, 1905, Jacob City, Massachusetts, where the Supreme Court um, said that, you know, we give government some pretty decent leeway when it comes to uh, things like, you know, national health crises. Um, the challenge is that, you know, the language in, in Jacobson is, is very problematic. And, you know, governments try to walk into court and say, we have the right under these old cases to do whatever we need to do when it comes to public health. But it's not surprising that that hasn't ultimately won the day. By and large, I would say courts have said, 
you don't, you can't do whatever you want. You know, you still need to abide by certain constitutional constraints because if this stuff is so important, then it really does need to be applied across the board. The idea of making exceptions for some and not others is problematic. The except the idea that you would apply this more to religious communities than other communities is problematic. The idea that you would give government discretion during these times without clear guidance also is problematic. Um, and so I would say, um, Ultimately, the Jacobson argument hasn't won the day. Um, Rabbi Kurtz has suggested I offer to take one or two more questions, although I could talk about this, unfortunately, for hours. Um, so um, I'm game to take more. So you're three hours earlier, so you can go all night. I can, I can, but it's only, it's only, it's only 909, guys. Don't you guys party late? You know, it, these are nighttime pandemics. We have classes till midnight. Uh -huh. Okay, fair uh, enough. I have a question here. Uh, Shelby okay. Brown, that was the one that asked about Jacobs. Okay. <clears throat> I, I assume you're a lawyer. That. Yeah, yeah, I actually am a lawyer. I was wondering why, uh, like, the Aguda went into the Eastern District when they had, they had a great decision. I mean, it wasn't their decision, but Sharp issued that decision in that Seuss case, yeah. which basically lifted all limits on outdoor um, <clears throat> excuse me, on outdoor events, and I guess gave, you know, compared a religious events to office use, which he felt was the best comparable. And here they went into the Eastern District on with some judge that had never seen the issue before. Uh, I guess people like to control their own litigation, but it just seemed like, uh, uh, and I guess there is, I think there's a hearing tomorrow and maybe the day after uh, in Seuss where I guess the Thomas More Society is going and representing, uh, you know, those same defendants, and some of them are in red zones, so they're able to bring the case. Maybe there'll be, be some more interveners there uh, yep. as well. But you wonder why, like, why go to a new court with a new judge? And um, do you have any idea why they why they might have done that? Certainly don't want to speak for the Agoda here, but I suspect that it's something to do with the limited application of this original Seuss decision, which was really, it bumped them up, I think, to 50% capacity for shuls and other similar institutions. Um, sure, you have a judge who have heard, has heard stuff before, but that judge also um, didn't seem like uh, he wanted to go quite as far as they, as they were going to need in this litigation. Mm -hmm. I can see why you might have, why you might have gone elsewhere. I mean, it's a very challenge, you know, the claim that the Agoda is trying to push, mostly if the end, if the case ends up continuing, is a very hard one, you know, as I've tried to express, you know, cracking people's skulls open and figuring out what, you know, Governor Cuomo means or what he intends is very, very, very difficult. And, you know, to call him based on the text of what he said, as if he's anti-Semitic, I mean, that just seems like a really rough go. And so what you're left with are these complicated arguments about numbers. And, you know, the attorney for the Aguda tried to explain this problem and the judge wasn't having any of it. So I think the Aguda unfortunately has a loser of a hand. Um, I've spent right now an hour and 12 minutes trying to explain kind of what's at stake in this case, what it means to apply rules across the board. But it, I mean, I think the judge gave him about 30 seconds. So, um, you know, this is a, it's a tough thing to do, to convince somebody in the face of a global pandemic that uh, they should loosen restrictions. Even Seuss, that's the last thing I'll say, even Seuss, you know, the, week, the very next week, the same Northern District of New York heard the case about the Jewish camps wanting to open in the state of New York. And the judge said, no, the two judges are down the hall from each other. You know, they, they know they're in the same courthouse. They know they know what each other are doing. So, you know, you want to open a little bit of capacity in a couple of shuls, a judge says, yes. You want to tell me that 150,000 kids are going to be in camps over the summer and who knows what's going to happen, judge says no. Now you've got a governor who says, we've got a massive problem with positivity rates. We probably do. And people's health is at stake. That's a tough argument to make in federal court. I mean, ultimately judges are, don't want to sit up at night and worry about what have they done? Rabbi Kurtz? So uh, I was looking at your bio, and in addition to your knowledge, of course, of American law, you also have a background in Jewish education, Jewish law as well. 
So I was wondering is, can we take what you're applying now, how would you understand in Jewish law, when we talk about determining intent, many positions that contemporary rabbis will take, they'll say something like, well, it seems that this initiative is being influenced by secular values, being influenced by feminism, insert whatever movement you want. How would you take what you're explaining in American law? How would you take that and extrapolate it to Jewish law, that same challenge? All right. First of all, I definitely call somebody who's not merely a rabbi for tax purposes. And second of all, that was a worthwhile joke for those who caught it, I think. Um, Jewish law is far more willing to divine the intent of people just generally. I, I don't mean it in the, the context you've just described, but when I think about commercial law for, for, for halacha or, or the like, um, our willingness to um, interpret contracts, um, I think by and large, um, and you know, I, I don't have a good sense of why historically this came to be the case. Um, halacha is willing to say like, adaita de hachi for this reason, on this basis, they entered into this agreement. You know, it's a good kind of standard garden variety example. Divine the intent of parties in the way, you know, you know, contract formalism in American law doesn't, doesn't, doesn't buy. You know, why is it that, um, you know, Hazal generally were, were more willing to say, I can divine the intent of someone? I don't know. Maybe when you live in a closely knit community, you feel like you have a better sense of why people are doing what they're doing. The more you know people, the more you live with people, the more you share values with them. Maybe you think you've got a better sense of what they're um, what they're aiming to achieve. Um, certainly, with respect to some of the issues you raise, I'm, I, you know, I'm not. I don't intend to you know, express a view, but um, maybe there is something to be said that um, you know. It's funny when I got on the call at the beginning, so um, a couple of folks were just. What are you up to? What are you up to? Sharing stories of where they've been and what they're doing and when they get to see people. Um, there's something nice and intimate about the way in which we as communities, I think we feel like we know each other. Maybe that's filtered down to Chazal in some way and our willingness to say we, we know what people are thinking for legal purposes. I don't know. I don't have a strong sense right now. Maybe American law in that way is coming around to, to Jewish law um, in terms of a willingness to divine intent. Um, we're thinking about further. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Helfen. I know it's hard over Zoom, but uh, I think it was fantastic. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Really a wonderful pleasure. It's, it's nice for me to be able to share with others things on my mind, and uh, I hope I've uh, um, been able to at least uh, illuminate somewhat um, the, the screaming and yelling you hear in the papers. Yeah, no, thank you very much, and Hashem should bless you in all your ways, and God willing, uh, we'll see each other in person very soon. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.